Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back. Um, we're going to talk to you today about pricing differently. Um, my name is Todd Steele. I'm Director of Product Management here um, for a software monetization group, part of our product line. And, and one of the... Um, Hi. <laughs> it's okay. Um, what I want to talk about today is, is, some, is a recurring problem or recurring conversation I'm having with customers in the market. And I'm really interested, to be very honest, to understand if you, as the audience members, are thinking about this in the same way. If you're seeing um, similar adaptive uh, pricing strategies around monetizing an SDK, monetizing a middleware, monetizing a technology component that you're selling to somebody else who's then going to embed it into their own application and sell it beyond. Um, so that's the purpose of this session. We're going to talk about how we, as Jamalto, had this exact kind of problem stack um, come to us. And, and Vicky's going to talk about, about how we use the Sentinel product family to solve this. How do I price differently? How do I monetize an SDK or a middleware uh, type of technology differently in today's solution stack? OK, so, so the challenge, as I mentioned, how to monetize an SDK? Well, right, when we're talking about mobile SDKs, right, the, the mobile market is becoming more and more and more complex in terms of the business applications and the business processes that you can perform or your customers can perform on their mobile clients. This, this naturally is occurring or naturally creating an, an area where SDKs, right, or middleware is being created more and more frequently um, to add value to an app developer's life. Um, but of course, with that comes the challenge of, well, how do you monetize an SDK? Of course, for years and years and years, you have IDEs, you have SDKs out there. How are they monetized? Perpetually, right? Perpetually with maintenance. The maintenance gives you support calls, but once you've integrated, right, your end customer integrates the IP, the SDK, and starts delivering it, you have no licensing mechanism to necessarily turn it off. So maintenance, you know, whether you have it or not, it's really only doing support. So then the question becomes, well, can you sell a, an SDK like this in a subscription model? Well, what does subscription model mean? What does it mean when your term ends, right? You're, you don't want the application that they resold to the actual end user to stop working. So subscription is a very funny way to price. It doesn't make a lot of sense. And so this is where consumption-based models are becoming much more prevalent in the SDK world, right? I don't want to sell a subscription or a perpetual sale based on a percentage of revenue because that's really the only fair metric to sell an SDK. Instead, I want to sell based on what was used. How many end users actually turn on the functionality inside the application that my SDK is built into? This is the fair metric uh, model for pricing. Um, if I can get this, okay. But don't believe it for me, right? Some market statistics, right? By the end of this year, 50% of software providers offering consumption-based pricing models, right? It's the way the world is going. By 2019, 50% of all industries will have adopted consumption-based models. And by 2019, um, we'll have personalized, 25% will have personalized uh, pricing all based on the metrics of customer behavior tracking. What did they use? How often did they use it? When did they use it? For how long did they use it, et cetera? And this is becoming an emerging um, way to price your SDKs. I want to be able to price an SDK that has a fair metric value for a very large deployment and a different price for a very small deployment. It doesn't exist today in the perpetual world unless you start using an adaptive um, licensing and tracking and entitlement management system. So that's what Vicky's going to talk about, exactly our need for this space. We, um, as Jamalto, were going to build an SDK and wanted to sell it, and we ran into these challenges. Well, how are we going to price this thing in today's modern world? So, Vicky, over to you. Thank you, Todd. Um, yeah, so as Todd mentioned, um, I am part of the operations team. Um, part of my group's job is to work with various stakeholders uh, within the business units to figure out how to do licensing, preferably using our own um, technology. So we did just that. Uh, we engaged earlier this year with the e-banking business unit. They had a specific use case, and they came to us and asked for help, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Okay, so 
their use case was um, they were designing an SDK that they would sell to banks. Um, so it's for mobile banking applications. So the core competence of the e-banking e team is to provide security um, and authentication mechanism for this mobile app. So when the bank would integrate the SDK into their mobile application and users want to authenticate, they can do so using biometrics, um, specifically uh, facial identification, face ID. So this biometric authentication is becoming more and more popular and banks are looking to use that, not just who you are by password or PIN and things that can get stolen, but, but what you are in terms of fingerprint, face ID, and those types of things. So the idea was to develop an SDK, sell it to banks, who will integrate into their banking mobile app, and then um, and customers can use that mobile app to um, authenticate and to um, basically transact with the bank mobily. The facial recognition technology itself did not come from Gemalto. We actually licensed that from a third party vendor. So we, there are multiple stakeholders in this chain. There's the third party vendor that provides the technology for facial recognition. That gets integrated into our SDK. We provide additional value add, sell it to the bank, gets um, you know, built into the mobile app, and now you have the end user. So four main stakeholders in the chain. Um, it's key to note that when the end users use the mobile app, there's lots of functionality there that doesn't have anything to do with facial ID, but they can opt in or enroll with this facial ID feature. It's not an all the time thing, it's just as needed as the end user prefers. And we were interested in counting how many end users are opting in. So there were two main reasons why the e-banking team wanted to do this counting, counting of who is enrolling. One is because they wanted to price accordingly. So historically, you know, if there was a similar offer by Gemalto, they would sell to the banks, they'd sell the SDK, and they might try to monetize based on number of users, but it was just a guess. Even by the bank, the bank would say, yeah, I think 50,000 end users, 100,000 end users. They'd pay us maybe based on that, but it was totally a guess, and neither us nor the bank would really know if that was accurate. Um, we wanted to change that, and we wanted to actually monetize based on the actual number of end users. A secondary reason is that we wanted to ensure compliance with, to our contract with the third party vendor. So we're paying royalties to a third party technology vendor and we need to assure them that we're actually paying them based on the number of people that are using the technology. And then uh, I guess I'll say a 2A, an, an additional reason is because uh, we wanted to put some protection around the, the actual code um, for the biometrics to prevent code lifting of the, bi the biometric technology. So several reasons, but the main driver was around pricing. So we interviewed the um, e, you know the e-banking e team and asked them you know what was your journey? What were you, you know, what did you go through? How did you end up here? They did actually consider building internally, building themselves, um, and then also they they understood that within Greater Gemalto there's some of this technology, best-in-class technology available. So yeah, maybe they should consider that too. So thankfully they did. When they went through the analysis, they, they found out that unlike what we heard yesterday where developers say, I can just do that in a day, they figured out that it was actually gonna take them longer and cost them more to try to build something this complex themselves. So you know, the existing you know, best in class solution made more sense for them. Um, we'll get into the exact solution I think in the next slide, but Sentinel Fit, which is what they chose as their licensing technology, um, was designed for embedded devices, so it was very easy. The design made it very easy to port over to Android and iOS, which was exactly what they needed. Um, a third thing that, that really, if, if that weren't enough, what pushed them over the edge is that we, Gemalto, had already established, pre-established a, a back office infrastructure that was Sentinel-based uh, over the last few years, and they realized that this could be somewhat of a plug-and-play type application, so meaning not only do they have to consider the work to be done to build the technology into the product, but there's also that back office piece that Zara, I think, talked about and, and several others. Both needed to be considered, and we already had most of the back office existing for them to plug into. So they chose to buy versus build. All right, Tyler, this is you. Yep, so real quick, before Vicky starts showing you diagrams of, of how we actually went about deploying it, I just wanted to level set and introduce you, if you don't know, the products, the Sentinel products that she's going to be talking about. The first is the e Sentinel EMS, something that's been talked about a lot, so hopefully you understand that. It's the entitlement back office 
system really helping you to automate the whole licensing workflow from creating your product catalog to fulfilling and taking an order, creating the license, fulfilling that license, and then ultimately creating uh, the, in the tracking of the activations. How many actual users of this facial recognition should we bill for over the, very, over the various uh, billing period? And then sec secondly, um, <clears throat> Sentinel RMS, which has been talked about also uh, during the event so far, is our software licensing toolkit. We also have a Sentinel Fit, which is a companion product, um, which is a licensing, software licensing system designed for embedded environments. So if you have a very low restricted, um, uh, a lower, res very restricted uh, operating environment in terms of RAM consumption, flash consumption, processing power, then we have a custom built licensing system just for that that plugs into EMS um, very easily. So those are the two components that uh, Vicky is gonna be talking about. Okay, so I'll just go through kind of the mechanics of the implementation. Um, starting on the upper left, so kind of step through it. Uh, first, everything's triggered by a customer PO. So we get a PO from the bank saying, I want to, you know, I want this SDK to integrate into my mobile app and I want to, I think I'm going to use, you know, I'm going to have X number of users use it. And they, they typically approximate up front. Um, customer service receives that PO, um, enters order details into our ERP system or back office system, just kind of a white box there. But um, we do have uh, connectivity, or connectors between our back office systems and the Sentinel EMS platform, as we mentioned. So programmatically, you know, a entitlement is created in Sentinel EMS, and a unique entitlement ID is passed back to our back office systems, which then triggers a notification to the customer that contains a link to download the SDK, as well as their unique entitlement ID, which is going to be embedded into the, uh, into the mobile app that they develop. Um, I'll leave the right, right slide, uh, right portion of the slide for now and just loop back through the steps. So after the customer notification is sent, then there's an internal notification that goes to allow us to invoice uh, the customer up front for, for the purchase and also to another um, group within Gemalto that has to now go to basically pay our third party technology partner um, for, for that usage up front. I, I do want to note that in some of our consumption-based models for other products, we do more of a usage, true usage, meaning um, we, we wait to see what the usage is and then we bill month to month or quarter to quarter after the fact. This is more of a prepaid upfront. Um, they buy a block of, of licenses based on an approximation, but no longer is it a guess. It, it's, we can count and we can adjust as necessary. Once we find out they're getting close to the number they've pre-purchased, we can go back and ask for additional POs. Um, Picking up in the gray box where the customer is, the bank, so now they've received the SDK, they integrate that into their application, um, they deploy that app, users you know, begin using the app, and then each time an end user wants to enroll with this Face ID feature, um, they do so in their mobile device, and that um, triggers a call home to our back office, to the Gemalto back office. I think that's key, you know, um, we have this problem always where we're one level removed or one step removed from the end user, we, we typically would lose that, keep that visibility. Now we actually can see when a bank's customer is, is enrolling, it's calling back and, and incrementing a counter in our back office um, and then licensing, you know, that end user's device. Um, so a lot of visibility, a lot of data we talked about um, you know, data being powerful. So I think this is definitely powerful, not just for pricing, but for, um, for metrics and for BI. Okay, so moving on, um, the system of truth, Sentinel EMS is our system of truth. We have one place where we can go to see what is the true count of end user activations, and we can track things like expiry if we're talking like annual base licensing or time, time bound licensing. And the, the usage reports that we can pull out of Sentinel EMS can go to any number of stakeholders, to the customer, um, our customer, to our own internal stakeholders, and even to the third party vendor if they needed evidence of the number of, of uh, users that are using their technology. Um, and the last part is around pricing. So there's two tiers of pricing here, or two different types of pricing to consider. We just wanted to give you an idea of what that looks like in this use case. On one hand, there's the third-party technology uh, vendors pricing toward Gemalto. So we pay a royalty fee. It's tiered based on the band, the number of users. Um, so if it's less than a million, we pay a certain price. One to three million users, another price, and three to five million, so on. 
Um, and then we pay maintenance based on a percentage of that royalty. And then the more um, you know, direct pricing implication is what pricing are we giving to our customer, the bank? Uh, we do charge them like a one-time setup fee just to get them onboarded and to get them you know, plugged into our system. Um, then we also charge tiered based on the number of users um, according to bands. And then we, we charge a maintenance fee as a percentage of that license fee, which varies depending on whether it's a perpetual license or an annual license and whether they want silver or gold level support. Oh, this last slide. Okay, so just in, to summarize, what did this look like? How did this project go? We put a quote uh, from Alwyn Wong, who really wanted to be here but wasn't able to. He's from our e-banking team, and he's the product owner for this, uh, for this SDK product. Um, he's, he was very clear that he, he was very much a fan of the, of the decision that they made to go with the Sentinel uh, solution. He said that fit, fit was perfect for them. It wasn't too complicated to compile it for Android and iOS. The bulk of the integration time was actually figuring out how to use it to prevent the code lifting, which was almost the secondary piece um, in terms of the counting and doing that for pricing purposes. He said it was, it was very easy. And in total, he estimated that his R&D team spent about two to three months of, um, or man months of engineering time. Overall, the, product, the project implementation was around seven months, and that starts from when they really, we really started talking about design and solutioning all the way up through launch and including testing and, and all of that plugging into the back office. So realistically, about seven months end to end. But the key result for them was that they could now charge based on actual number of end user uh, enrollments versus a guess. Cool. So that, that's our presentation. We wanted to just you know give you visibility into two things, two different things. One, of course, really I see more and more frequently that SDKs need to transform how they're being priced because pricing perpetually on trust, as we know in software world, it just doesn't make sense, right? And and if you go start looking at platforms out there, there really aren't platforms designed to handle tracking users and monetizing how you sell SDKs and deliver those SDKs. So I wanted to bring that visibility and show you that, you know, as Ariela said, we are eating our own dog food. We, we love this stuff and, and, it, and drinking our own champagne. Um, so this, this was the purpose of the conversation. Um, any questions? Any questions? Please. Wow, great, lots of questions. I love this use case. Seriously, it's uh, amazing. Uh, I've not seen or been exposed to the FIT uh, SDK yet or whatever, but it showed that the activation actually gets registered and you do push a license key down That's for right. the use of the facial recognition mm -hmm. To turn it on. That's right. Um, and is, it's basically just a flat bit on off or does that FIT model it's, it's a also fit license. support yeah. different it's models? Can you... Yep. Can you have meters in that and everything else? Yes, yes. Sentinel Fit is a, is a licensing platform. So it's not as feature rich as RMS. Um, for example, it doesn't have network based licensing because it's built for right, restricted environments. But the idea is, is that um, with Sentinel EMS, right, you have the ability to, to protect something with RMS, to protect something with Fit. They can live side by side, different products, right? EMS handles kind of the target platform. Uh, or the target license that's for that. But Sentinel Fit does support license models like expiration date, you know, perpetual, number of executions. So it's a typical licensing platform, but it's a bit feature reduced because we're trying to reduce, you know, the impact. Thank you. And and then sorry, second question. You there was also a deregistration, right? There was an activate, deactivate. Does that affect your revenue model or your payments? Um, the enroll, unenroll? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So actually I don't we're just launching it now, and I wish Alan were here. He could tell us for sure if that unenroll decrement, you know, actually reverses the count. I know there was discussion we wanted it to. So whether the customer unenrolls intentionally or deletes the app, you know, ideally you'd free up that license and and you know not charge the bank. I don't know that it made it into the GA release we're releasing right now, but that's the intention. If it didn't make it in this release, then it was supposed to go in a future release. But kind of both models are supported then, right? Yes. Do I want to track the number of concurrent? activated licenses out there, or do I only care about how many are turned on and if they get turned off? So it, both are supported in the system, depending well, on I imagine you, you can support activate and no, no deactivate. Yes, mm -hmm. right, of course. Sure. Yep. Thank you. Other questions, of course.
Um, so I, it was very interesting to know about the utility use case here. Do you comp your sales people who are associated with this particular team also based on utility measure? Uh, is the sales comp any different for the, like, you know, the e-banking team because it's based on usage? Uh, no, no, it's, it's no different. I mean, uh, the, the compensation model didn't change for sales, which is what you're asking, right? Because as, as Vicky said, there's the pre-buy of licenses. So that's kind of like the pre-buy, right? And the idea here is, is we, don't want, we don't want licensing to drive a bad end user experience because who we're licensing to isn't the actual end user, right? So the tracking is more for the true up to say, ah, you bought 100,000 licenses, right? But you really activated 150 Let's reopen, you know, a sales negotiation about this. You're overusing. Mm -hmm. So if the customer doesn't true up, uh, do you shut them off or do you allow them to go out of compliance? No. So this has to do with the, it has to yeah. do with the contract, right? How you okay. build the contract for the technology. Okay. So in, in our deployment scenario, we don't we don't have a uh, we don't turn off the license uh, based on a non true up. In the flowchart, you showed that it was one license key that we send to the bank, right? Which they will then embed in their app or whatever software they're using. But you mentioned 100,000 users versus 150,000 users or licenses. Yep. Are each of those a separate license key or is it still yeah. that one license key that Jamal to give them? Like, okay, okay so, so, so this goes to something Jam said is, is it's good to, uh, uh, to level set on terminology, right? What, a, what is a license key in your mind? So there's a key that you send the end users so that they can activate, right? So this is static across all, all users, okay, for this deployment scenario. But what's delivered is a unique license tied and locked to this specific device, this specific mobile device. So every license, 150,000 licenses, are all differently, uniquely different. Those what are we, uniquely different from Jamalto? Jamalto sends those 150,000 licenses, or is it the bank who sends it to the end customer? We send it to. And what we send to the bank is an entitlement ID, a unique entitlement ID, let's say for 100,000 users. So that entitlement ID is unique to them, but within that entitlement, if it's for 100,000 100, users, each activation would trigger a unique key to be delivered to the end user. So, so essentially the library, right, the SDK that's provided to the bank app, right, it has a turn on facial recognition call, right? And, and as part of that process, everything else is hidden from the end user and the banking app itself. The Jamalto SDK takes care of the activation to EMS, getting the license, installing the license, and before that even getting the fingerprint, right, and sending it back. And what's so, the time like since it's the bank's customer kind of now um, getting way near, to near get instantaneous. Key. It's real time. It's real time. Near real time, let's say. Thank you. Yeah. So where does the um, pricing and tiering information actually live? Does it live inside the EMS or is the EMS just exposing data to another system that has the pricing and tiering data? Pricing is, in this case, pricing is not in EMS. It's in our uh, ERP system and on our published price list. Yep, so, so EMS is just the record of what was activated over what periods of time and by whom. So I'm intrigued about the protection against uh, code lifting. So two-part question. So uh, did you folks have to engineer the solution yourselves? Were there not other solutions out there available that you could have taken off the shelf? And secondly, is that capability now available as a part of Jamalto offerings? Mm -hmm. Because code lifting good. is a big concern for us. Two very good questions. Um, so we have, we have two, um, how do I say it? So in, in our product portfolio today, we have a product called, or a component called Sentinel Envelope. Okay, Sentinel Envelope, which is a post-compiled uh, security tool which will take, take your compiled binary and add obfuscation and reverse engineering protection to it. This tool um, is, supports all the major desktop platforms. Um, it supports Linux, it supports Windows, it supports Mac, and, and it supports Android, okay? But for this project, um, we want, or the, the banking team wanted something a bit more secure 
as well as something that could be across virtually any device. Um, so in, in fact, we used an internal tool um, that we don't expose or, or sell to the market, but, but it's something that we've discussed about bringing to market, to be very honest, um, packaging this internal tool that we use for our components to, to deliver to the market. So if, if this is a problem space that you're having or you're seeing, then definitely engage with us because as the product manager, I wanna make sure that there's a market before I do too much investment in taking our internal technology to market. Mm -hmm. Hi. So one more question. No, no. Um, just wanted to get clarification on the concept of pay for what you're using. So the bank is a customer of yours, right? That's right. And they do that initial purchase. If you go back to the flow diagram, you know, the purchase happens. Is there a quantity associated with that purchase or some sort of a limit to that? Uh, you know, because I didn't see a look yes. back of how the bank then will compensate essentially the EMS holder, if you will, for the intelligence consumed. Yes, yes, it's a, it's a pre-purchase, but it's, it's not a hard limit. It's, the system doesn't say, after this limit, stop to not allow any more activations. So it's a soft limit. So they pre-purchase, and then the idea is the activations and the tracking is for sales, for a tool for sales to use as a true up mechanism, right? You've signed a contract, you paid us for 100,000 users. Right. We see over this billing period, you actually did 150. So either you have to buy more now or, you know. Right. And of course, we can always turn it off, but that's so, part of the So there's a back the office, basically, true up process. Behind it's a true up. Well. Okay, right. thank it, you. The idea is, is to use the true up as, as a sales mechanism rather than as a, you know, hand slap. Yeah. Thanks. Great, thanks for your attention. Thank you.